Hello again. Welcome to this session of Books and Words to Inspire. I'm Randy Dawkins, author of futuristic fiction with a science fiction feel and a Christian perspective. We're going through my first novel of the Steel Prophecy Pentology, entitled Mercy of the Iron Scepter, and seeing what parts are actually mentioned in scripture. There's more than you likely recognize. The first sentence we come to in the book that is scripture-based is on page 11. It reads, in this time of Earth's history, death did not occur unless it came by the hand of the king. Let's think about this sentence and what it's really saying. What time of Earth's history are we talking about? Well, if you were with me last time, we mentioned that this pentology is about our future in the time known as Christ's earthly kingdom. This is a period of time, future to us, when Christ returns to this earth, sets up his kingdom, and reigns from Jerusalem over the entire world for 1,000 years. Why 1,000 years? Well, we get this time period from the 20th chapter of Revelation. They, meaning those righteous martyred during the tribulation period, came to life and reigned with Christ 1,000 years. We find that in verse 4. Yet nowhere in scripture does it state explicitly why the length of Christ's reign will be 1,000 years. The exact why is somewhat elusive. Perhaps because this would show how God can create a utopian society that can last longer than man can live. Adam lived 930 years, and Methuselah, who lived the longest of any man according to the biblical record, died at the age of 969. But Christ will show that he can do better, and it will only continue to get better. I should mention that some do purport that scripture passages, such as Psalm 90 verse 4, Hosea 6 verses 1 and 2, and 2 Peter 3 verse 8, do imply the millennial day theory, where each day of the creation week would, worth, would correspond to 1,000 years as a corollary to when both the psalmist and Peter state that in God's sight, a day is as a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years as one day. In this theory, because creation occurred in six days, with God resting on the seventh day, this represents a pattern. If a day is as a, is as a thousand years, then this pattern would indicate that the world would last for six thousand years. Then there would be a seventh, one thousand year period of rest, which corresponds to the length of Christ's earthly kingdom, as we just mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. To show the length of these divisions, they would be the following. One, from creation to the time of translation of Enoch. Two, from Enoch to the time of Abraham. Three, from Abraham to the time of King David. Four, from King David to the time of Jesus Christ, five, from the time of Jesus to the Crusades, six, from the Crusades to the time of Christ's second coming, then the time of Christ's earthly kingdom for the last 1,000 year period. While this theory may be true, the time of ultimate rest, represented by Jubilee, which we will discuss momentarily, is the time of eternity which is actually after Christ's earthly kingdom. That is when true rest will occur because rebellion will still be possible during Christ's rule with his iron scepter. Yet, the idea of a promised kingdom which God will establish has been part of Israel's history since its inception. It is mentioned throughout scripture in both the Old and New Testaments. Both are specific references to such in Genesis, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Micah, and Zechariah in the Old Testament, and in Matthew, Luke, Acts, Romans, and Revelation in the New Testament. Yet there are other books where such a kingdom is also implied or prophetic to such a concept. Therefore, it's hard to deny that the Bible doesn't support such a kingdom to be established in our future. Also, 1,000 years is 20 jubilees. A jubilee occurred every 50 years. And this occurred at the end of seven Sabbath years, being seven groupings of seven years, where a Sabbath year occurred every seventh year, and was a time of renewal. All debts were forgiven, all land went back to its original owner, and people had a chance to start over. We could all use a jubilee, couldn't we? In biblical numerology, the number 20 is a number representing a cycle of completeness, and this certainly applies to this time period. So that may be one reason for the length of this time period, but what about death occurring during this time? The sentence we quoted earlier from my book states that death can come only by the hand of the king. This seems to imply that no one will ever die over a span of 1,000 years. Is that possible? 
Well, yes, I think it is. How can we believe such a thing that seems impossible to us today? The main reason for this thinking is that the Bible mentions only two resurrections, a resurrection of the righteous and a resurrection of the unrighteous. Let's explore this further. Here is a timeline of how the Bible depicts history. Each of the Jewish festivals or holidays presented in Leviticus chapter 23 are prophetic of what has occurred in history and what will occur in history. For example, Passover or Pesach represented Christ dying on the cross. Unleavened bread or matzah represented Christ being sinless in the tomb. First fruit or bikurim represented Christ's resurrection. Pentecost or Feast of Weeks or Shavuot represented the giving of the Holy Spirit. These are all collaborated by the Apostle Paul in his writings in the New Testament. Now to our future will be the fulfillment of the other festivals or holidays. Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah will be when Christ turns his attention back to his people Israel again and marks the time of the tribulation which will drive both Jews and Israelis back to their homeland. This is the topic of my book, Promised Kingdom. Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, will mark Christ's second coming when he will forgive Israel as a nation and heal their land. Tabernacles, or Sukkot, will be the start of Christ's earthly kingdom. This is the setting for Mercy of the Iron Scepter and the other three prequels after Promised Kingdom, Hope Renewed, Darkness in the Light, and Iron in the Scepter. The term Iron Scepter means Christ will not tolerate rebellion and it will be dealt with immediately. While he will have compassion, he will also instill justice. Only those who rebel and are judged by Christ, hence the meaning of his Iron Scepter, die during this period of history. In my book, this is referred to as the banishment to the place of lost souls. This is also mentioned for the first time on page 11 of my book. Now within this timeline are two resurrections we just spoke about. The resurrection of the righteous seems to come in several stages. One, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul tells us that the righteous who have died since Christ's resurrection and those righteous alive at the time of Christ's coming for the receiving of his bride, which some call the rapture, would be caught up to be with Christ and be taken into heaven where he has prepared a place for them. Two, in Revelation chapter 11, during what is called the tribulation period in the New Testament and Jacob's trouble in the Old Testament, God has what are called two witnesses to proclaim his word from the temple that would be erected during this time. The one who scripture calls the Antichrist will have them killed about midway through the tribulation and after three and a half days they will come to life again and ascend into heaven. Three, at Christ's second coming, which will be at the end of the tribulation period, these righteous who were martyred during this horrible and dark tribulation period would be raised to life again, as stated in Revelation chapter 20. And four, what are called Old Testament saints, or those who Christ took from Sheol to heaven after his crucifixion and resurrection, will also be raised at this time of Christ's return, just as God promised. Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 12. The Bible states that these individuals become part of what is called the first resurrection, as depicted in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then in Revelation chapter 20, it states that once Christ's earthly kingdom is over and Satan is released, he and his followers try to overthrow Jerusalem but fail. Sometime later, the great white throne judgment occurs. All those left who have not yet raised are resurrected and judged, and those found not written in the book of life are thrown into the lake of fire with Satan and his angels. And this is called the second death. This passage seems to imply that no one from this resurrection is saved from earth from eternal death. And it calls this the second resurrection. So from this we can surmise that there are only two resurrections that occur, one for the righteous and one for the unrighteous. The first resurrection occurs before Christ's earthly kingdom begins, as those raised will help him rule and administrate his kingdom. Then the second resurrection is at the end of Christ's earthly kingdom. There is no mention of any other resurrection. Therefore, if the first resurrection is at the beginning of Christ's promised kingdom, and there is no other resurrection of the righteous, it would imply that no one who is righteous will die during Christ's earthly kingdom. So who were actually part of Christ's earthly kingdom? We just mentioned the righteous who were resurrected. They will have glorified bodies, as Paul mentions in his writings, and they will help judge, rule, and administrate Christ's kingdom. 
Will there be those like us today who have mortal bodies? Yes, at first it would be those who survived the tribulation period. In the Gospels, Christ himself taught that when he returns, the unrighteous would be removed from the earth. That means in the beginning of his kingdom, only righteous individuals, whether mortal or glorified, will occupy his kingdom. Yet, over time, those with mortal bodies will have children. These children would need to learn to accept Christ as the ultimate hope for their future, just like we must do today. Those that do not will likely be more prone to believe the sayings of Satan once he is released back into the world at the end of Christ's earthly kingdom. Those who do not keep their animosity to themselves and rebel will be taken by Christ, the King of the world, sentenced and judged. As stated earlier, Christ's iron scepter will rule during this time. All that the Old Testament states about this will come true. There will be no want. Children will play in the streets and old men will watch them. Animals will lose their animosity. Fruit and vegetables will be in apple supply. And peace will reign everywhere. It will be a time we have never yet experienced. All will be right with the world. So here it is, a time of peace, a time of life without fear of death as long as you let Christ be your ultimate hope for your future. Are you excited about your future? Doesn't it sound wonderful? Yet what would be true then is also true today as well. To avoid the second death, you must accept Christ as your ultimate hope. You can't get there on your own. He has paid the price God required. All you have to do is accept it. I hope you do that if you haven't already. Also, I hope you visit my website for more information. It's simple to remember, randydawkins.com. Bye for now, and we'll see you next time for more of what Mercy of the Iron Scepter reveals to us from the Bible. God bless.